Good afternoon, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to live career chat at lockdown number four. I'm Deirdre Hughes and I'm your host for today and delighted to be working alongside Chris Percy, who's a UK economist and a careers researcher and um, who has a lot of expertise in this very topic of evidence and impact assessment in the career development uh, landscape. Uh, lovely to see the chat facility being used here. Um, I see that it's very rainy in Lancaster in the northwest of England. Um, hello to Siobhan in Nottingham, uh, to Natalie in Norwich, uh, to Frank MacDonald in Ireland. Um, just keep uh, your uh, messages coming through on chat here. I won't go through every part of the world where we have someone um, joining us, but hello from Singapore uh, and hello to John from Belfast. So a very, very um, warm welcome. I really wanted to begin really by just explaining really why we chose this focus of the career development landscape. Three very, very uh, brief reasons. One is that career development is a central role in government responses to COVID-19. Secondly, that lifelong uh, career education or career development um, or guidance or counselling, wherever you are in the world and the term that you used, is firmly back on the policy agenda. And I think most importantly, as we in our different countries um, experience perhaps the, aid, the end of wage subsidy payments. In Australia, for example, it's called JobKeeper. Here in the UK, it's the furlough scheme. They were at a critical juncture around um, crisis points uh, when it comes to um, people's jobs and their livelihoods in some cases. Um, and having access to career services. So really just wanted to very quickly um, highlight uh, the critical importance of this. Now just to get us all warmed up, um, because we do want this to be an interactive um, session and uh, great to see Helen there from the Isle of Man uh, with a little smiley face. I'd like to begin really with a quick um, icebreaker. I'd like you to think of one word that describes the career development landscape in your country. And no cheating, just one word. We'd like you just to type that into uh, the chat facility. My word is turbulent. Positive, underfunded, uncertain, patchy, optimism. I have stratified, dispersed, fragmented, exciting, different, challenging, bitty, disparate, exciting, political, underfunded for local authority, varied. So we have quite a, a mix really of positive and perhaps some trepidation in, in some cases. Um, I think uh, if I move on to my next slide very briefly, just to set out, uh, and I'm not going to read this slide in great detail, but just to set out really what we would uh, like to achieve with you as a result of working together over this next um, three quarters of an hour or so. Really, Chris is going to take us through most of this around focus, techniques, limits, purposes and, and principles. We're going to use some scenario examples and we are actually going to very much focus on ide ideas sharing in this uh, webinar. So before I hand over to Chris, um, let's just have a look at our very first poll. And I should say Mark, our IT expert, is with us. And Mark is just going to introduce a poll um, for you to complete. So here's our first question. How confident are you that career development professionals can strongly evidence the impact of their work? I see quite a bit of movement here already. Ah, 
We seem to have gone from confident to perhaps majority not so confident. And I hope that that means that today's uh, session will build confidence. Oh, and I see that confident has overtaken. Um, it's looking like a reasonably fairly even split here. Still a little bit of movement. But I think what I'd, I'd like to do with your permission, I don't want to rush things too much, but I do want to get into the meaty substance of, of the um, presentation, so discussion. Let's just agree that um, it's sort of sitting around confident, not confident, um, in terms of the majority uh, of responses. So let's reset the poll and let's start another poll just very briefly and put ourselves into the mindset of policymakers. In your country, are policymakers interested in the evidence base for Korea's work? Chris, just looking at the polls here, can you see um, any surprises there or does it look about what you would expect to see? I think so. The push towards yes and sometimes feels feels fair. Absolutely. So if we, um, if we sort of take it as a given that um, there will always be places where this is not viewed as number one priority in policy makers um, line of um, influence or interest. Um, let's just imagine that we have a scenario where actually there is high demand for more evidence based on career development. Let's have a look and I'm going to hand over to Chris now to sort of talk us through some of those key key issues and factors. I'll just skip over this. Yes, thank you Deirdre, thank you. So I mean yeah, mixture of sort of confident and not confident and some degrees of interest certainly feels fair. I've been working in this area on and off uh, since I was a civil servant on, on the England side back in uh, 2006-07. And yeah, it, it, it definitely, it, it wanes and waxes, this, I think. If you could have your chat open, there's a question I'd like to ask you. I'm partly stealing your ideas here, but there's, a, there's the question on the screen there, different impacts of career development. If you could type in what you think some of those impacts might be, and I'm hoping that when I show the next slide, I'll have captured most of the ones you raised, but I bet I won't have caught all of them. So just the sorts of things that career development can help. It can help people um, become more confident in their job searching, make them more resilient. It can help them improve their salaries, get off benefits and into work. What are some of the impacts of career development that you can see? Hope, well-being, motivation for learning. Yep, yeah, these are great. Pride and confidence. Ah, and a, a fascinating one here, which takes us away from the individual lens, um, you know, meeting sector needs and social mobility. Some of these that are, almost operate more at a, at a societal level than they do at an individual level. Raised aspirations, decision-making, more organization, senior leadership support, yet recognizing that career development, and it isn't just for people just entering their careers or struggling with their careers, it's actually for growth and development, or can be um, at all stages. Progression to HE and FE, fewer needs, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Lifelong learning, self-awareness, fantastic. And if we've seen maybe 40 or 50 flash up on the screen there, there's there's probably a reasonably even mix between those that are quite sort of narrowly economy and finance focused and those that take a broader view. So I saw references to health and crime in there as, as well as the well-being point, self-esteem uh, that I mentioned there. So let's see how many we've got on the screen here. Curriculum support, I'm pretty sure that one is missing. So that's a that's a great one to, to list. So this, this is a... And, there's a, there's a dozen different frameworks for these things. You'll, you'll never get a, a fully comprehensive list. Uh, but this is one that's sort of been, been gradually accumulating in a few reports, which says you can trace through, specifically thinking about economic outcomes, you can trace through from individual ones 
which kind of gets increasingly specific as you go out in terms of how you can label them. Human capital, social capital, and supported transitions is still quite general. You kind of, it's, sort of, it's quite abstract, quite hard to pin down, even if we can all on the call think of some ideas of what that means in practice. Primary economic outcomes start to feel more, uh, more specific. So participation, decreased unemployment, skills. Some points around flexibility and mobility of the labor market there, which I also saw coming up uh, in some of the comments. Points around career management, points around resilience. Often that's part about having a more, a more flexible labor market and flexible interaction with it. But that goes on, so that those might be the sort of the next layer of benefits, but then it can go on from there to health and crime and tax and benefits. And then there's sort of playing out from all of that, these kind of macroeconomic benefits, often with multiplier effects leading on from the, from the previous outcomes. So deficit reduction, productivity, living standards and economic growth. Now, all of those have had quite an economic financial lens. And I've listed at the bottom some of these non-economic ones, which are often less, are often less sort of smoothly linked together like this. And it's kind of harder to know where to stop in a way, with things around finance, you can stop either when money is in someone's pocket or money is back in the government's pocket to pay for some of this stuff. Um, with the non-economic outcomes, it's kind of harder to know where to stop those measurements sometimes, but that their difficulty makes them no less the important. So support to personal, family, community and life ambitions, well-being, identity, resilience, agency, lifelong learning, lots of these echoing through the comments um, on the slide. So what we'll be doing, quite a few of these slides, I'll be showing a few bits of uh, references to general frameworks, a few examples of, of specific quantitative studies, and all of the references for these are at the end of the slides, and we'll be able to share these uh, with you afterwards. So those are some of the impacts, which I don't know about you, but it almost feels like an intimidatingly long list. Like this is, this is pretty, di pretty difficult stuff. Some of these are easier to measure than others, but some of them are really difficult. Hard to know where to start, hard to know where to begin with. Which brings me on to the other half of this, which is so we've, we've got a sense of what we would like to measure. Well, what are some of the techniques we've got for measuring these? And again, you can make these lists as long as you want, but to give a bit of a, a flavour of some of the ones that we've worked with at DMH Associates and that sort of exist more broadly, you've got these you've got these, these three large buckets and there's lots of spillover between them. You've got this qualitative bucket where you're, you're talking to people or, or drawing insight from something they're doing, but you're not trying to add those up. You might even think it diminishes them to add them up in some way. It simplifies what people are telling you. It's better to keep it with the narrative, those powerful quotes, maybe an image. People have done some work with primary school students. And if you get them to draw the, the different jobs they might imagine in the future. You get a, a kind of quite a powerful visual demonstration of something and you know you, you, you lose something from that if you start to add them up. Quantitative side is often what we tend to lean to first when we think about impact assessment. Descriptive data on what's going on, maybe we do some surveys pre and post, we track people over time and there's a, a million and one data tricks you can do once you've gathered this but fundamentally they all start with some sort of some sort of survey data or administrative data collection how much are people earning often that's self-reported you know are they off benefits that might be administrative data but you gather all of this stuff and then you, then you play with it there's a third category that we often don't think of as impact assessment often it sits kind of somewhere else in the landscape but actually it, it can be used for impact assessment which is theory-led and I, I want to talk a bit more about this later on, but for now, just to mention that if you're looking at this from evaluating a particular program or initiative, it's very unlikely that you will want to or be able to track those people for 20, 30, 40 years. It's, it's probably disproportionate. It might even be unethical in some cases. Like, there's all sorts of good reasons, practical and conceptual, why you can't track things forever. But where people have done research on this, they've drawn on long-term longitudinal studies or every so often people do long-term evaluations, you might be able to hook some of those bits of data together 
and link them in with your program. Or even before the program's been launched, you might be able to say, actually, what we're doing is very similar to what was done in this particular initiative, which was maybe a parental engagement thing in the Netherlands or a welfare to work program in Arizona or, or something else. So that we've got our program looks quite similar to this. It's not identical. The context is never the same, but it's got quite a lot of similarities. So maybe we can draw on what they learned, their impacts and say, perhaps our impact might be within the same sort of range. Around, so those are the three, three sort of very high level buckets. And of course you, you mix and match. As soon as you start doing a few interviews, as soon as you've got to more than 10 or 20 or 30, someone somewhere will probably ask you to add up how many people said different things. So qualitative starts to bleed into quantitative. When you're trying to interpret your survey data, you often end up coming back to quotes or coming back to narrative from people. And the theory typically underpins a lot of this. Around the edges of this, I've just made the point that kind of impact assessment, again, the mind often goes immediately to, uh, to direct beneficiary impact in the world of careers. Are these, are these folk getting into work? Are they getting better jobs? Are they indeed more resilient or happier than they were before? And that, it's probably fair that that may well be the biggest, but process evaluation can be really useful here. We did a piece of work um, for, uh, for social finance when they were doing a, a capital raise to fund welfare into work, particularly for those suffering from mental health difficulties. Their main question was, or one of their main questions was, is this process that's being rolled out in your projects, how faithful is it to these other projects which originated in the US where there had been this extensive kind of 20 year program of research and evaluation. And the reason they wanted to know that was they, they at least the funders in this case, the people that the, the capital was being raised from, big issue invest in a series of local authorities, they were willing to take it on trust that this program would have its desired effect, provided it was similar enough to these other ones. So that starts to look a bit more like a process evaluation. You might do that for continuous improvement as well. Then there's community building influence, broader stakeholder benefits who may be interested in things that go a bit beyond direct beneficiary impact. So, okay, so we've got a long list of techniques there. Interesting question has just been sent my way on the chat about which techniques do we commonly use? Now, I, I come at this with, with quite a quantitative lens because I'm a, kind of an economist by training and a lot of my evaluative work comes in once once programs have already been underway for a while, so they've got some data or they're planning to gather some quite large scale data. And it will either be pre or post or longitudinal tracking being the two sort of most straightforward ways to demonstrate causality without making something very complicated. So I focus a lot on getting as close as you can to a causal benefit that you can hang a number off. But the best of these projects are, are blended and interdisciplinary. And a nice point here, um, from Natalie referring to kind of how they evaluate the impact of their career service, career pulse questions on HE students. So you can do these, these kind of quick, regular questions to people and you can get much, much more rapid feedback than, uh, than might be in scope if you're trying to do a, a long-term impact assessment. So let's go on. Okay, so we've got a sense that there's this great long list of things we might want to measure impact for. And we've got a, a sort of list of techniques, some of which you know, can be pretty time consuming or data intensive to do. And the obvious emotion that comes at me straight out of this is, well, there's no way we can do this justice. Like that list of impacts that were popping up on the chat and that we saw in, in, that, in that flow diagram and the non-economic measures below it. The amount of evaluative effort and, and budget, frankly, it would take to try and measure all of those in a way that's reasonable it kind of can't be done, or rather you can't do it justice. And there's a point I want to make here, which is that the harder the measure, which is often the ones coming with my, my economic background and doing a lot of return on investment work for governments, the harder the measure, often the ones that a lot of these sort of more arm's length funders are focused on, the more they miss. So I'm often very focused on salary increase or are people getting into work or training? But you can imagine plenty of cases, they, they may be edge cases, they may actually be quite frequent, depending on the group of beneficiaries you're working with, where what is 
what looks like success when you're face to face or remote face to face with a person and what is captured in the data, they point in opposite directions. So if I'm doing, I do career development work at the local college, uh, I volunteer there with people who are um, adults uh, retraining to, to shift jobs. Not always, but, but often enough, they are looking to downscale their work. They are probably looking for a salary decrease. They're looking to increase their time or their flexibility. Sometimes they're moving from the private sector into the public sector. They want to talk to me what, about what it was like when I was a civil servant. Well, my ROI is going to really struggle with that. Welfare to work, it can look like a really straightforward binary thing, but what, what kind of work are we getting people into? How long do they stay there? Into training as well. Now, th this isn't, at least with my economist impact evaluation hat on, this isn't a reason for not doing it. It's just a reason for doing it cautiously and to always be honest about the limitations of whatever the metric is. Salary increase and welfare to work measures are extremely helpful if you're trying to persuade the treasury to pay money for it. You don't always want the treasury to pay for these things, but not often you do. And they might say, okay, look, we, we see the value in this. We're willing to put some money into it, but tell me what I'm going to get back. And they may not be let, they may be less interested in somebody who's downscaling. That may be genuinely a less beneficial outcome for them. So there's, there's for different stakeholders, there's value in these different, different measures. But it is worth, since we know we can't do the full topic justice, what are the reasons why we're doing it? And that helps to put a frame around understanding the pros and cons of different methods or think we're talking about this either internally in our own organizations or with stakeholders or with funders helping to convey what they should expect from any kind of impact assessment process and here are some of the reasons and then these are legitimate reasons to be to be pursuing any of these activities within a within an understanding of the limitations kpi reporting and this is management as well as funders because once organizations get to a certain size, that qualitative insight, the feeling of how do we know this is working, can be quite tricky. If you're three or four layers of management away from a conversation with somebody who's seeking, who's seeking help with their career, you need some sort of way of tracking this. It's not practical to talk to everybody all the time. Now, what those KPIs are, of course, that, that could, those can be quite expensive. But the idea is that you need to start to simplify. Formative assessment to drive improvement, and this is nearer the process evaluation. This is where you may be looking at numbers, but your primary goal is to compare and contrast, find ideas for improvement. Did we do it better three years ago or better now? Why, what's changed? Funders who are interested in return on investments. Sometimes, but particularly when, when evaluations are funder funded, <laughs> if that sort of makes sense, they're funded outside of the organization, they're funded by a research organization or by government. There's a genuine interest in building the evidence base for the future. And that might mean you can invest more money in pinning down an impact than is plausible in other cases. This one I've got in the middle there is to try and make the link from this to a theory of change. And certainly over the last 15 to 20 years, theories of change have become reasonably widespread. And often there, I have a single diagram, which captures, hopefully at a glance, a sense of what you do, why you think people benefit from it, and what the, old, the sort of the long-term goal is. And that's useful. But often that sits kind of oddly separate from KPI reporting, formative assessments, and return on investment. And yet they shouldn't. Every well-constructed impact assessment should reinforce maybe one chain, one link, one chain in that, the in that theory of change, maybe a few, or maybe all of it. Maybe it skips several steps and jumps straight to evidencing the bit at the end. But by reflecting all of this back into a theory of change and taking that opportunity to think about whether the theory of change is complete, kind of ties all these things together. Now, I don't know if there's, I don't know if there are reasons I'm missing here, or we're either, either sort of cynical ones or magnanimous ones. Are there reasons why impact assessment is important for you or your stakeholders that either aren't well captured or aren't fully captured in these, these buckets here? So a few, 
a few comments up in the chat here to, to share. Yeah, there's, the, there's the, the point being made here that I've got a lot around KPIs and ROIs and future work here, but the formative assessment, ultimately, a lot of this is being done in order to have more impact. You measure your impact in order to have more impact, not just to see what it is at that point in time. Find out who you, what type of groups you benefit the most, who you're benefiting less, therefore who might deserve more focus. Okay, so I think there's, I want to move, keep moving through this overview because there's some, some nice examples to share. A few principles that drop out of this. Impact assessment should be proportionate because we're taking time and money and we're possibly distracting our beneficiaries or our stakeholders from the rest of their lives when we ask them these things. But what is proportionate depends a lot on the stage you are. If you're doing a pilot, it may well make sense to you know, spend half your budget on evaluation. Once you're in steady state rollout, numbers more like 1%, 3%, 5% are probably a bit, a bit more natural. Um, purposeful, understanding who it's for, who you're trying to influence, whether internal or external. Plans, yeah, presented as part of a program. And this is linking back to that point about a theory of change. And it's also something that, particularly in work I've, I've done for, for government, some researchers are keen to emphasize. It can be easy if you're doing one large evaluation, a multi-year evaluation, a three-year project, it's a government-funded program, government-funded evaluation. It can be very simple for the stakeholders, particularly the funder stakeholders, to think that this, this is the answer. If that evaluation proves we work, we've won. If the answer proves we haven't, then it's all doomed. But any, it's very unlikely that any one evaluation would be able to give such strong statements. So presenting these things as part of a program that may partly draw on theoretical literature, may partly draw on other programs, may draw on other types of evidence that have been built up or planned for the future, helps to prevent perhaps a, a sort of narrow-minded interpretation of it. And as soon as you know, someone has put a, if a government department has put a few million pounds into an evaluation, they will naturally weight that source of evidence ahead of others. But the goal in planning it is to somehow encourage them to realize that there are almost certainly other sources of evidence as well. A lovely point here from Lydia in the chat that doing this work well can help identify staff development and training needs as well. Okay, so those are some principles. You may want to link it into prior work, uh, particularly when we start to do ROI work, assessments need to, need to link into that, and being self-aware of the, of the limitations of the process. Okay, let me keep keep moving. So I won't go through this slide word by word. It, the purpose of this, and as I say, the references, the full citations will be shared with you in the slides, is to reinforce the point that there's just, there's been a lot of this done out there. For long-term economic kind of hard outcomes, inevitably the database is more limited, but we're still talking dozens of studies rather than single digit studies. Um, and if we're looking for smaller scale comparison group trials, maybe 10, 30, 50 beneficiaries, um, qualitative work, we're, we are into the hundreds. The challenge then becomes finding the ones that are most relevant for your context or, or your project or your, your use case. We've got some, please do, Deidre, come in. Sorry, I was just going to say, Chris, uh, in preparing for this webinar, I was reminded that in 2002, um, this is when I first started uh, looking at the economic benefits of guidance. So here we are, 18 years on, um, and it's an itch that just hasn't, you know, gone away. Um, but I, I think you're absolutely right, you know, that um, back in 2002, actually, there, there wasn't a report on the economic benefits of career guidance. And it was whilst at the Centre for Guidance Studies that that work um, first emerged and Delighted Siobhan's on the uh, webinar here because they've continued, you know, with that um, that work. Um, so I think really it's important for all of us to know that there's a lot of stuff out there, basically, and it's trying to find the right hook for the piece of work that you're actually uh, developing. But if anyone ever says the evidence base is weak, there's not much out there, don't believe them because there actually are hundreds of studies, if not more. 
and hopefully the next slide will will bring this into life because although i know we have we have huge diversity of practitioners on these calls looking at kind of adults sort of young students uh students in higher education a whole range of things and people working at the policy research and organizational level as well as practitioners and managers so i wasn't really sure which ones to pull out but i pulled out a few and i focused on the long-term economic evidence uh, because these can be the ones that if you're trying to persuade someone's purse strings to open these can be the ones that are are most important um i picked four uh, which are typically the ones I know best. They're not necessarily the best that exist. As we said, there is a big literature, uh, but these are some that I know well, and, and we can talk about more of them if people have questions. We know that people who have better aligned ambitions and kind of, they can name a job they're interested in as a teenager. Might not be what they actually do, but they can at least name a, a one or two. They tend to earn more 20 years later. We know that careers talks with outside speakers have a, also have, a, have, a, have an earnings benefit. We know that people are less likely to drop out of higher education if, when they're in higher education, you ask them, what was your guidance like in secondary school before you got here? You know, what, what was it like? Was he satisfied with it? Was it all right? If they say they were satisfied with it, they are less likely to drop out. And it's important to say they're kind of asked that in year one, the dropouts are later on. So it's not, in I mean, there's always a bit of this going on, but it's not, an entirely, you know, benefit of hindsight, re, you know, reinventing uh, what your experience was to fit what your outcome was. We know that schools that hold uh, these sort of career standards tended to have lower neat rates and better GCSE results. All of these examples I put on the screen have uh, peer-reviewed work that are kind of large scale in some way. They've got extensive control variables or I think none of these have got a, um, a randomized control element, but there are there are a few RCTs in this space as well. So that's school to work. Then a few a few in adults. Um, now there must be some good work to work ones that are out there. I've, I've got to admit, I, was, I was writing a, a chapter for a collection on this a while back, and I looked a while for the evidence that moving from job to job, you know, job mobility. Uh, uh, brings evidence, uh, brings benefits. I found some things, but I wasn't fully satisfied. I wasn't satisfied enough to to put a, put them on a slide for you. So there is work out there, but it's probably an area where more could be done. There's some evidence that if you let your staff do outward secondments, that they tend to come back and be more productive. So there's, there are a few bits out there, and there's brilliant qualitative work. But welfare to work, unsurprisingly, given the the stakes um, and the funders. Uh, has been relatively well studied. Every program is a little bit different, but if you look across the ones, you could probably mix and, mix and match and find, one, find ones that fit a particular use case. And you tend to see pretty substantial, you know, single digit percentage point changes on these things that are, that are hard to influence. People collecting benefits for fewer weeks, saving the, the exchequer some money. And if we talk about the guidance interview as a, as a specific activity, you know, a one-to-one, -one, anywhere between 20 to minutes to an hour of talking about your career plans, perhaps doing a few in a row. This has been studied quite well, particularly for short-term impact, but asking people, how is your career decision-making improved? Um, how do you measure your own self-efficacy? How confident do you feel? And this is where there's pretty strong causal evidence because of the strength of the research that's been done. Those one-to-one -one conversations, whether they're remote or otherwise, they work. What it means to be more career decided, now that's a bit tricky and that's where we start to get into some of the evidence above. Okay, let me let me stop there. So we've got examples here working with young people, examples here working with adults and kind of the transitions along the way. An area that's, oh yeah, I mentioned one area understudied, work to work, within that perhaps particularly is how you can support people with Kind of want to, I think phased retirement is probably the word I'm looking for, but how can you support people through that in a way that supports their needs, maintains uh, sort of opt-in productivity as, as best as possible? I'm sure there's more to be done there. Last slide before we open this up to a, to a bit of discussion. If you're doing this from a return on investment point of view, you often want to get as far as a particular outcome that someone else has then costed the long-term benefits of. If I go back a slide, 
um, the benefit of people transitioning from employment to, from unemployment to work. So what? They may be unemployed in three months' time or 10 months' time or, or whenever. Someone doesn't drop out of higher education. So what? What's that worth to the exchequer? Well, the good news is that for a series of long-term outcomes, there are kind of really really big studies, the kind of studies that would be unrealistic to replicate, um, you know, budget-wise, resource-wise, expertise-wise. And all we need to do is hook into them from a career guidance perspective. If we can demonstrate, and this isn't, this isn't unreasonable, if you're, if you're working with secondary school students who are at risk of need, age 17, 18, you could track them to the age of 19 and find out whether they actually were neat at any point in that period. That is a reasonable level of tracking to do within the organization. As soon as you do that, you can start to hook into uh, other reports. As always with these things, there are reports that give you a very big number and reports that give you a very low number. So you kind of need to be quite savvy about defending which one you use. But the point is these, these do exist. And even before you've done any work, you don't even know whether your program works yet. Given these sort of financial long-term outcome reference points, you can talk about the break-even parameter. And you can, you can say to your funders, or you can discuss internally and say, if only one in 1,000, I'm looking at the higher education one, if only one in 1,000 of our beneficiaries did not drop out as a result, when the baseline dropout rate is about seven to 10%, um, then if our intervention is 80 pounds, we've, we've broken even, anything more than that is, is money in the bank. So that can help contextualize numbers for people that they might worry that an intervention sounds expensive, but it, it often isn't if you put it in a break-even sense. Okay, let me, let me move on here to the discussion point. And what I will say is we can sort of have as, have as long or as little as we want on this. We've got a lovely kind of appendix full of slides with some specific scenarios, examples of impact assessments that Deirdre and I have worked on. And we'd love to talk you through that. But we'd love even more to, to have, have a discussion if this, if this can work with such a large group and thread through the chat. It's, it is possible to speak as well. I'll pass over to Deirdre now to let us know how we can work this part of the, the session. Well, thank you, Chris. This is the bit that we're always excited about uh, trying to get the conversation going. So this is really how it, how it works. You should see on your screen to the right hand side, there's a little speak a little hand. Um, if you would like to speak at this point, um, uh, just click on that hand. Now what will happen is that um, you'll be invited to speak and there'll be a little, once you're invited to speak, there'll be a little audio test and it just will ask you to allow your microphone um, and then you will come into the meeting. Um, then what will happen is when you've finished, uh, you will go back out, Mark, our IT person, will put you back in the meeting and someone else will have a chance to, to talk. So um, who's going to be the brave person who's going to put their hand up first? And come and join Chris and I. It's lonely here when you just see two, two, two heads on the screen. Is there anyone who would like to tell us what's happening where you are, um, particularly around any new and emerging approaches? Uh, within this current uh, new normal that we're all living in. Or if you have questions or comments um, about the preceding slides, of course, flag that up as well. Put it in the chat if you prefer. Yeah, I, I, I'd echo what, what Sarah is saying in the chat about kind of work to work being understudied. It's, I, I, I didn't see anyone else put this, um, but when we were asked that one word at the beginning, my word was underfunded. And, the, and I think there are, there are understandable reasons why it's underfunded. But one of them is that the, probably the biggest part of this, most people are in work, you know, compared to those who are unemployed, the majority of people are in work. And if we're not looking at the benefits on those who are moving job to job, they're probably missing the larger part of it. Yeah, I really like Sarah's uh, Sarah's point here. Interesting that work to work is understudied. Mm -hmm. um, again, keen to hear your views on, you know, are there any particular aspects that are um, understudied? I see that John Wallace uh, has joined the room. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, it's been really interesting, guys. Thank you very much for that. 
um, a Scotsman who's working in Belfast <laughs> at the moment. Um, with the uh, career service in Northern Ireland, um, like the other home nations, um, guys, what we are kind of doing through the, the, the COVID crisis is that we've had to react um, very, very quickly to um, the way that we deliver our services. And I've got to say that we've all um, uh, had, had difficulties with um, looking at uh, how to work um, with the new technologies, but we're kind of getting there slowly but surely. But one of the things that I'd like to share with you is that what we are doing on the ground is that we we kind of know that there's going to be a lot of people that are furloughed and being made redundant at the moment. So the offer that we're giving across uh, here in Belfast is that we're looking to re um, upskill and reskill people that might have lost their jobs or be furloughed at the moment. And we're looking at, um, you know, the, the, the areas which require, um, you know, jobs, um, you know, with jobs in the future. So uh, digital skills um, upskilling is, is very much at the front. Um, and, you know, those um, sort of, you know, looking at the, the OECD reports, we've very much aligned the skills and the training base uh, here to, you know, what those, um, you know, official reports have been saying. It's really interesting in Northern Ireland how the OECD uh, recent review uh, is sort of providing an anchor point in a way for some of that really interesting development work, John. Thanks ever so much for that. Um, I know that we've got colleagues from Australia, the Isle of Man, all over Europe, so I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear what's going on um, in Belfast. So thanks for sharing that. I see we've got someone else's hand up and now, so I'm... Uh, going to uh, see John has left the room and see who's going to join us next in the room. And just while that's joining, I'll, I'll pick up this point around digital skills. And someone again made the point earlier on about uh, kind of sector, kind of economic management, sector skills shortages as being something you can tackle through careers guidance. There's been some sort of tantalizing work, OECD work, as well as some done by the Education and Employers Charity in the UK, looking at if you looking at the the level of disconnect between what young people say they want to do when they're older versus the jobs that exist, and it's tantalising because there's some evidence that if they do more careers guidance, which typically isn't sector focused, it's not it's not saying oh you must do this, you must do that, you tend to find that people that have done more careers advice are in aggregate less disconnected from you know, those projections of labor force demand. Suddenly it's not everybody saying, oh, I want to be a YouTuber, or everybody saying, oh, I want to be a footballer. They're in, in aggregate, they are fractionally more aligned. So there's a fascinating area to explore there as well. And we've got Emily. Hello, hi. hi. Um, so I'm, I'm a researcher, as you two know, so really interested in everything you've been talking about. And it was really just an observation, um, having worked in education research for um, in about 20 years, that there's been this huge ascendancy um, in randomised control trials and a lot of emphasis within policy and research on measuring things very specifically in that way. And I, just my observation is that that's doesn't lend itself as well to career guidance outcomes because the outcomes are so varied. We're not just interested in GCSE results, it's so much broader. So I think it's about, I think some of the challenges speaking into a context where there's a lot of enthusiasm for RCTs and there's very hard kind of measures um, and where this just doesn't fit in the same kind of way. I'm just interested in your observations on that. Yeah, now let me let me comment first. I mean, I think that's I think I think it's I think it's spot on that the particularly the sort of the traditional randomized control trial approach where you as sort of a single researcher has control over the, the start of the trial, the intervention happening, and then the end of the trial. The problem there is that even to do a short term evaluation, so you, you start to look at two or two or three years to look at a few months to set the whole thing up a year for the intervention, then you measure the impact, then you close the trial. That whole process, getting the funding for that, writing it up, tends to take three years. And you've still only measured a relatively short-term impact of that intervention, i.e. A, a sort of three to nine month horizon. So one of the RCTs I did on careers talks um, did show benefits in terms of 
GCSE results and did show benefits in terms of people changing what career and education pathway they plan to do. But that was super short term. If we're really interested in these kind of longer term outcomes, RCDs, at least in the traditional form, just get weaker and weaker for, me for measuring them. And yet there's a, there's, a, there's a class of stakeholder that you can easily interact with on this, for whom whatever bit of evidence you show, they'll say, oh, what, what does the RCT show? And it's tricky because on the one hand, they're, 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 they're thoughtful, knowledgeable, you know, they're trying to engage in a constructive discussion. On the other hand, they've, they've absorbed quite a simplistic view of evidence. And yeah, it can be tricky. There are no, no answers, but just to, just to reinforce and agree, I think. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, I think um, in the career development sector, traditionally, um, there has not been a um, strong level of interest in randomized control trials, partly because, you know, of some of the ethical issues around, well, you know, you have to have a control group and um, ethics around denying individuals um, uh, access, say, to guidance, just because you want to prove that guidance does actually make a difference. Um, but I know uh, here in, in the UK, you know, I led a, a study looking at quasi-experimental and experimental studies um, in career education because there was a real sense that the career sector hadn't really done anything on this uh, at all. So I think whilst I, I totally agree with you, Emily, I think for the sector, there's a real sort of note of caution um, not to shy away too much from that theme um, because I think it leaves the sector open to criticism that actually it either hasn't got the expertise nor has it got the interest. So I think it's a it's that kind of a balance but I, I would err certainly on the point and agree with what you've just just said Emily. Thank you very much for sharing that. The, way, the ways they come in best mm. is when you've got a large program that's oversubscribed and then you can randomize who gets yeah. it. Exactly. You know, some of the best work that does touch on education and careers, typically, you know, employer engagement might be part of a broader program. But this, it doesn't work well for small interventions because they don't tend to be oversubscribed as programs. They're not, they're not big programs in the same way that, say, applying for a course of study might be or a, a new college opens up. Um, any other comments or thoughts? We've I see that Carol has said, what's the boundary between careers information advice and guidance and upskilling when we're evaluating impact on job seekers? The welfare to work um, evaluations tend uh, to focus on the impact of the training, not the advice. And again, I think this is an interesting one for us because often welfare to work is seen as very separate to the career development landscape when actually, um, the welfare to work agenda and the career development agenda um, cross over in many, many areas at many different levels. So my, my sense is that we mustn't shy away yeah. from that and, and work in silos, that there's a lot we can learn, as, as Chris has emphasised, from the welfare to work studies. Just before we say a few more words about contemporary developments, just wondering if anyone else does want to come in and uh, say a few words just give you a chance to maybe while you're thinking about it um let me give you a couple of headlines around contemporary developments in um uh the uk europe and, and internationally as chris said we've got some examples tangible examples um of some of the work that we're involved in that we can gladly share with you but often people come on our webinars because they like to actually uh hear you know what's going on in in different countries. So here's a very quick, quick whistle stop um, tour of developments as I see them on this very topic. But first of all, more countries are um, looking at how they can increase access to a range of career development services, either to assist with transition, support, motivation, employability skills, or health and well being. Poverty, happiness, and well being were three themes that came up in a meeting that Chris and I earlier were involved uh, in, in, in Wales, sort of thinking about the evidence base and how you get a return on investment. So think about the themes, you know, in, in your work um, that really, really resonate with you. In Australia, and uh, I 
know that we have Caroline from Australia who's busy away on the uh, the chat uh, sharing all of the really great things that are going on uh, in her part of Australia. But there's a new National Careers Institute website. Um, there's great focus at the moment, as Caroline's already alluded to, pathwork, pathways into work for secondary uh, school students. That there's a productivity commission in Australia where they actually have found that young people were actually suffering income loss before the pandemic. And um, in fact, even here in the UK, some of the work that we've been involved shows that young people before the pandemic were really struggling to get a foothold into, in some cases, training or indeed paid work. Now, quite interesting, in Finland, the Ministry of Education and Culture, and you know how we always, if you're from Finland in our call here, Finland always seemed to be that one step ahead. But the Ministry of Education and Culture They've just announced a three year project for the development of guidance and career education. They've put about 21 million pounds into this investment with projects very specifically focused on needs with access to career guidance for young people after their schooling. And most importantly, cross ministerial strategy, which here in the UK, um, we still are striving uh, to achieve. Now, just quickly in New Zealand, there's online uh, planning, digital solutions, very high priority with the Tertiary Education Commission. And in New Zealand, the Career Development Association for New Zealand have just been invited to embed career guidance in community projects right across um, New Zealand. Finally, uh, in Canada, there's a great focus on youth at the moment and in Eastern um, Canada and the eastern sort of region, there has been some evidence um, around um, career services demonstrating positive changes um, on a whole series of multi dimensions to mental health and well being. And I think most importantly for all of us here in this um, webinar, it's all about gathering our stories. That's another important way of the evidence base to capture those stories that can actually be shared, to bring some of the, the raw data and the facts and the figures to life, really. And Canada in particular are doing this very well. So I just kind of wanted to give you that quick um, sort of overview. And maybe just to sort of think about now the nuts and bolts of your work and thinking about um, what kind of examples can we bring to bear that might give you some food for thought, stimulate some ideas. I'm going to hand back to Chris on that. Yeah. Well, actually, maybe I did say to Chris, <laughs> sorry, Chris. Uh, yeah. Chris, I want to talk about funding envelopes. <laughs> so I'm going to very quickly encourage each and every one of you to buy into this concept. And that is that policymakers across the world, when it comes to really the next few years, where there are going to be really tough decisions around austerity measures, perhaps even greater than we experienced previously here in the UK for sure, that career services, um, career development um, agencies, I would encourage you to develop what I call your career development funding envelopes. And that is not to shy away from costing your services and to actually be able to use some of the evidence base, some of which we're sharing today, to actually link your service delivery and your design to creating those funding envelopes. And Chris and I are doing some interesting work on that at the moment. So just hold on to that as an idea. If there's one thing you remember from today's webinar, think about which funding envelope are you working on that you will have in your back pocket if someone says to you, I've got more money to spend or I've got less money to spend. So I just wanted to make sure I got that in. It's my sort of real passion that we've got to get these funding envelopes ready over the coming months and years to uh, ensure that we protect the very best of career development services. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, we've got some we've got some good calls uh, in the in the comments for some links to those developments you were describing in in New Zealand and elsewhere, Finland and elsewhere. Great. 
So we should be able to share those as well. We can put them at the back of the slide. Yeah. So what I'll do now, let me, almost with just a few minutes, let me show, show you what's in the slide so that when they come round, you know if it's useful and you know if you want to take a look or, or get in touch with us. So a few a few case studies. This is this was the National Citizen Service doing these sort of programs, uh, mostly for 16 and 17 year olds. And they found, it, that's actually the purpose of the National Citizenship Service, but they, they found that it's anecdotally, it seemed to be helping some of their students apply to university, either with their personal statement that they wrote or just for whatever reason, it happened to be encouraging them to apply and get in. And their problem was they had, um, they had all this data on the people who did the NCS, but no data on anybody else. So they had no control group or comparison group at all. They had like 100,000 people or something in their, in their service group. And it turns out that there is an, an excellent service offered by UCAS, and we, we designed the project for NCS to, to go ahead and interact with UCAS on this. Well, what you can do is you can submit the name and postcode and date of birth of your beneficiaries, and they will take all that in, they will find an artificial control group using the postcode. So they find people in similar sorts of postcode in terms of um, historical disadvantage in accessing university and various other things. And they will compare. Well, first of all, they will find what the what your folk actually did. Did your beneficiaries actually apply to university? And did they go on to get offers and be accepted? And how do they compare to control group? And then they send that back to you in a way that's kind of anonymized and, and sensitized. You can publish it directly without needing to worry about all of the private and sort of GDPR sensitive data that UCAS is holding. So they found a way to share that data. Fascinating initiative and one they're happy to talk with people about if you want. An example too is, is a project that I supported but Deirdre led. So I might ask for a, a minute from Deirdre on this welfare to work. Yeah, just a, a few words. Um, if you're someone who's working with adults, particularly vulnerable adults, um, this was an interesting project uh, that we're still very much involved in around how is deeply personalised support um, actually helping uh, vulnerable adults get closer to self-sufficiency, social inclusion and the labour market. And we actually did undertake some formative evaluation, um, really looking at supporting improvement journey, uh, as well as actually meeting uh, the funders' needs. Um, interestingly, this project, because of COVID, have had to totally transform their delivery uh, model um, and really look at digital. Does digital work with vulnerable adults? Uh, uh, Christian here says, I'm working with vulnerable adults. Uh, interesting to hear, you know, your views on that. But in the, the Dorset um, study, um, the funders were very interested in return on investment. Um, in this case, it was a, a big lottery fund, uh, but a combination of European social funding as well and, and uh, close work with the Department for Work and Pensions. And I think one of the, the big interesting pieces in that was we were able to actually look at the database um, uh, of the um, records that the uh, practitioners were recording. This was something years ago we tried similarly in uh, Dor uh, Northampton to sort of begin to look at those forms that the practitioners fill out to begin to sort of look at distance travelled. And what's been quite interesting in this project has been then to look at the academic literature around um, as Chris said earlier, how can we kind of compare and contrast other studies that may be complementary um, or similar? And um, it's just a, a real live example of we look at this around how can these vulnerable adults in some cases take baby steps to progress as well as some giant leaps back into employment. So we've had a real mixture of vulnerable adults ranging from somebody who's in their mid 50s, never missed a day's work in his life, has worked at the airport, displaced from the airport, desperate to get back into some form of work and actually managed to find a new job as a result of this initiative. So, you know, the when we talk about vulnerable adults, there's so many different dimensions, but this is a good example of that um, 
having a good sound evidence base from other studies that are quite similar and then actually looking at how can we work out return on investment with in some cases limited data because as we know often imperfect data because not every practitioner is driven by filling out um, their forms eloquently and to completeness but uh, we're working on this and again uh, interesting study thanks Deirdre should we move on to the last so we, we I mentioned this earlier on actually this was the RCT on careers talks so let's with our with our final minutes I think we have a a slide just to show you what a nice uh, exercise a, a Nesta funded project that Deirdre and I are working on We've got some detail here on how you relate a research base to an ROI, which I'm just, just moving through as fast as the system will allow me to. Different technique for handling uncertainty, given we never know the truth of these things, but we can get reasonably precise. So this is, Deirdre, do you want to mention a bit about yeah. this? Yeah. And then yeah, I'm always a great believer. We must always stay on time. And now we're one minute over, so very, very quickly. Um, we're working on a chatbot. Uh, this is another dimension. How do you measure the impact of a chatbot? Um, this is work in progress, uh, funded by NASTA and the Department for Education. If you're interested in chatbot developments in the career development landscape, please do connect with us. Both Chris and I are involved uh, in a team working on this, and we would love uh, to uh, hear from you and see what we can learn from each other. Um, other thing really just to share with you uh, before I say thank you, I'm going to ask Mark to share his screen with you very briefly. Uh, we're hosting a major international virtual conference on the 20th to the 22nd of October. Just have a, a quick look here. It's on our, our website. Um, Mark will keep scrolling. Um, you'll see from the photo of me that that was taken about 30 years ago. Uh, it needs to be updated. Um, but we've got a really impressive lineup of speakers and we really hope that you will be able to um, uh, join us. Uh, you can just click on our website. We'll send you the link here. Natalie's asking, is the chatbot available via the University of Derby? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, but of course, with our colleagues at the University of Derby, we're always very, very happy to provide an update and share uh, what we're doing. We're in a competition uh, and that uh, chatbot uh, will be presenting uh, to Setafop in October. And by Christmas, We'll have a beta version and we'll be really keen, perhaps having another webinar uh, to share that with you. We've got a CDI webinar on that subject coming up. So if you're in the CDI, please do uh, come along. Someone mentioned uh, Leanne um, Hamley. Uh, we've been working with Leanne, who's given us some brilliant um, ideas and tips around how we can build coaching into our bot. So please do um, stay close to us on this, but most importantly, come and join us at our international conference. We'd love to see you there. We're using Zoom, but we're also going to use a social networking website. So there'll be a lot of sharing and learning informally, uh, all the things that we would maybe do if we were face to face. I'm going to end now. Sorry, Chris, did you want to say a few words? Uh, just to say that a few people in the chat, both privately and in the universal chat, have um, asked questions or, or mentioned getting in touch. So please do, you've got our email addresses there. We'll also try and pull up individually if, we, if we've if we got enough detail from your logon name to find you, we'll try and, but very happy to share the document we're talking about and very happy to keep talking. Yeah, so after every webinar, we always keep a list of all the questions, then we send out a note and we try to respond wherever we wherever we can, if we've got your details. You've got our email address, reach out anytime. And we look forward, um, maybe our next careers webinar, maybe we won't be in lockdown, who knows? Um, let's hope not. But thank you for your time. Your work is really, really important. It changes people's lives. And I also want to thank Mark, the hero behind all of this, who's doing uh, great work on the IT. And so our colleague from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, delighted you two were able to join us. Uh, we're very optimistic, can do attitude, and um, we hope that there are good and exciting times ahead for all of us. Take good care of yourselves, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Chris.